Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about murdering random people with flying robots. Uh, Excuse me, doing noble targeted drone strikes. Except when Russia does them, because then they're evil. We welcome back two guests, Nick Modern and Kathy Kelly, our co-coordinators of BanKillerDrones.org. Nick is on the board of Veterans for Peace. Kathy is president of the board of World Beyond War. And they have a new project we'll be discussing uh, at MerchantsOfDeath.org. Kathy and Nick, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Hello, David. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming on. So why why are drones back in the the corporate uh, news all of a sudden? Well, I think that um, this whole uh, Iran drone introduction into Ukraine uh, has the, you know, the Western military powers very worried. Uh, And the victims, quote unquote, those being, you know, killed and, and terrorized are uh, white people. Uh, over the last 20 years, uh, the United States has been on a, a campaign, really, of, of terror and killing using drones in the Middle East, East Asia, and Africa. Some of that is still going on right now. These are all attacks that have been conducted against people of color, uh, they've been conducted far away from any kind of uh, television coverage. Uh, there's no way to get these on the front page of any paper who would care to get them on anyway. Um, the other thing that's very concerning, I think, um, to the United States and the West is that these drones are very inexpensive. They, they cost about $20,000 a piece. They are one-way uh, drones called kamikaze drones. But they do have optical systems that allow controllers to to have them loiter or circle in the air, search for their targets, and then crash into the targets, whether those are groups of of humans or whether those are uh, buildings, towers, you know, electrical grid, uh, that kind of thing. That costs $150,000 and is on a, you know, a a round-trip drone that requires maybe 200 people just to manage, whereas these very small six-foot wingspan, you know, flying bombs can be launched off of any kind of truck. Uh, So they're a very different kind of thing for the U.S. military and others to contend with, but they are a substitute for soldiers, just like the drones that we've used in other places. And they're an, a result of all the technology that U.S. has put in to, you know, killer drones along with Israel and, and, and other drone developers. It, it has seemed to me, uh, Kathy, <clears throat> that, that in addition to learning what Ukraine is, people are learning from this war, uh, perhaps because of the, the whiteness of the victims uh, and, and all of the endless weapons shipments. They're learning that weapons cost money and they're learning that wars have victims? Uh, are they perhaps also learning something about drones that we've been trying to scream about for, for decades now? Well, I think as as Nick has pointed out, it's become of greater concern that these kamikaze drones are so available and more portable. And uh, the proliferation, of course, is going to exacerbate wars, prolong wars, make it easier for people to start wars. But I still think, David, that there's not a lot of recognition of the life-altering consequences when somebody survives a drone attack. I mean, we don't really hear much about displacement of people in other countries where drone attacks have been going on for such a long time. We don't hear about what it's like to survive, but to be maimed, to have your body mangled and burnt and face all kinds of Uh, terrible suffering for years and years to come. I mean, I suppose that's very much on Nick's in my mind because we've just been very focused on one person, Adel Al-Mantadi, a Yemeni man who survived a U.S. drone attack in 2018. Well, nobody in the U.S. State Department or the Pentagon is going to take responsibility, it seems. 
for Adil, who's now facing his third surgery. He's he's in a Cairo hospital because no one could help him in Yemen. His sons have to be there as his caregivers. He's got years of physical therapy still to face, psychological trauma because his four cousins were mangled and killed in the same attack. Well, there are people like Adil all over the world. And um, their stories never make it into public awareness. So in a way, the Ukraine war has, yes, made people more aware, but I think it's a kind of a keyhole that we're looking through rather than seeing the, the vast uh, carnage, displacement, terror, and maiming that has gone on along with all of the bereavement and the orphaning of children. Why why do you two think that drones have been out of the news? Uh, I mean drone US drone murders out of the news. Are they are they happening less? Are they being reported less or are they being accepted as routine or all or none of the above? Well, I would say it's all of all of what you what you have said. Uh there has been a, a, a relentless campaign on the part of the U.S. government to present the drones as a kinder, gentler way of doing warfare. People feel, oh, yes, it's a, like a surgical strike. It's, uh, you know, this is something where only the bad people are killed. And right now in Marion Federal Prison sits Daniel Hale, who, whose transgression uh, was to reveal the, the true nature of war, uh, war drones in Afghanistan. The, the government, U.S. government, did a study that found at one point, over maybe a five or six month period, only ten percent of the people who were targeted by drones were the, the ones killed. Ninety percent of the people who were killed by U.S. drone attacks were not even those they were after. <laughs> And, and when I say that, that doesn't mean that the, it was legal even for them to be after that 10 percent. So if you if you have a public that has been persuaded that, that this is, a, you know, a, a better kind of war, then the press is it buys into that. We had a, we at one point we had the, the press reporting, including democracy now about drone attacks. Now we see that all morphed into airstrikes. So we don't know which are drones and which aren't. But what we do know is that the U.S. government right now is still conducting uh, drone attacks inside Somalia at the very time that Somalia is facing a horrendous famine. And, this, and, and, and so we have the press here treating people as masses of people rather than these are all people just like us, individual people. There's a very interesting book called Humane by Samuel uh, Moen, and <clears throat> he talks about how it's very recently published about how drones are very central to the idea of sanitizing warfare so that it becomes more acceptable uh, to the general public. Well, I, I just had to put a note in here. I, I was in the Navy. I, I was in Vietnam, uh, and I, I did not participate in combat, thank God. But I did see the result of it. And I will say that when you get in a war, there is no clean war. There is no precise war. There is no war that doesn't involve vicious parts of our nature that you and I, everyone has, that can be awakened in the interest of survival. And these drones are a substitute for soldiers. Kathy, I want to ask about uh, a, a, a ninja bomb uh, and a recent drone murder of a guy named Ayman al-Zawahiri. You know, the United States was presenting that particular attack as a very precise attack in which they successfully eliminated any collateral damage. But what wasn't presented was just why it is that there's not collateral damage when you use one of these ninja bombs. And the ninja bomb uh, is fired by a drone, but this particular version of a Hellfire missile, when it makes impact, sprouts out um, blades, kind of imagine like a lawnmower, so that the person who is hit 
is chopped into pieces. And that's got to be quite terrifying when people who are among the targeted population know that, um, you know, that would be assurance that they are not going to survive. And okay, so there's not collateral damage. But then do we think that others aren't going to also develop this technology? You know, there's a uh, a worldwide interest in being able to come up with drone technology. And um, Nick has mentioned that poorer countries can make the kamikaze drones. But as, as more and more of this technology becomes available to people, it, it will, I believe, be incredibly terrifying and frightening to be on anybody's assassination or kill list. Um, and then there's also the, the profit motive. It's, it's a vicious cycle, isn't it? Because there there are more and more profits to be made from developing uh, new technologies that are related. I, I, Nick lives near an L3 Harris facility. In fact, he goes out and protests once a week early in the morning. But, but can you tell about the goggles, Nick, that people are, are now able to use um, that, that enable them to get the feed from the drones? There was, a, there was an article in Defense One this morning about L3 Harris now developing a kind of, well, they're really kind of goggles where the video feed from a drone can come right into the goggles so that soldiers can see what the drone is seeing and then either, you know, fire their drones back or, or artillery or, or, or whatever that might be. So the, the, there are millions of dollars to be made, millions and maybe billions, for this ancillary uh, equipment uh, to, you know, for, for drone warfare. Um, and then, of course, then we don't get into, I mean, we, we could mention also the drones for, for the ocean under sea. We can, we can uh, talk about land, you know, uh, robots on land are, you know, armed. Uh, there's a concern about armed robots now uh, for the Oakland police. So th this kind of substituting uh, is uh, for humans with machines is where we're headed with war right now. But in inevitably, the, in the end, it's going to be the civilians who uh, are, are going to be the subject of, of the machines until one side is ground down and then the other has to just submit. And so th this is not... A, Machine war does not save humans. It makes humans more and more vulnerable. But this is where it's headed. We are speaking with Nick Mottern and Kathy Kelly, who are co-coordinators of BanKillerDrones.org, among many other important things. And it, it seems like both of you and, and I and many people, it wasn't difficult, were warning years and years ago that other countries would get these things. It wouldn't be just the U.S. and Israel who had these things. It seemed so obvious. And, of course, now it's happening. Um my only explanation I can think of is that the weapons companies don't mind that. They think it's a good idea for everybody to have these things. Um, is I mean, did did the brilliant, uh, you know, brightest of the brightest running the U.S. military, did this not occur to them? Do they not mind? Do they think it's a good thing? Did they think they could handle it with counter drone technology? What's what's going on here? Well, I, my appraisal is that the, the U.S. has the kind of hubris and uh, sense of superiority that would suggest that they can always out-technology anyone else. And um, during the Obama administration, I think it was 2016, legislation went through the Congress with no uh, objection, with no debate. Uh, but backed by lobbyists for the aerospace industry, lobby legislation put uh, drones into the U.S. airspace. They created a situation where uh, basically drones had a, had, had a free run any, anywhere in this country and in, in, in with the AUMF in, in the world. And so this whole beautiful open window for for drone technology is being flooded by these corporations who are, are figuring out ways now that uh, fighter jets can have their own swarm of, of drones to go with them ahead and, and attack, survey, and then they can go in after the 
you know, the ground fire, the air defenses are suppressed and do their bombing and, and this kind of thing. And of course, uh, well, where are humans in this? Oh, well, yes. Well, they're, they're going to have to die because that's the way war is. That, that's the thinking here uh, is that we've got this massive separate world from our own of technology in the military that will prevail and the U.S. will be the leader in that technology. You know, David, on um, two Sundays a month, uh, Nick and I meet with about oh, 15 people from different um, parts of the United States and then a few from Europe with a band killer drones call. So we hear regularly from a woman in Germany. And for years, for six years, the German government really did debate usage of weaponized drones. They were going to get those kinds of drones from Israel, and there was a, a an opposition sufficient to delay it. But with the advent of the war in Ukraine, um, I think mainly fear drove the Germans to just throw out the window. It's like it evaporated, all of that discussion. And now they're becoming one of the most militarized forces in the world, and they've got a tremendous potential to expand. So there's that reality of fear, but I think it's also greed that is driving much of this. You know, it, it, Craig Whitlock writing for the Washington Post, uh, really with two Freedom of Information Acts, came up with a boatload of material about retired U.S. military who are making six-figure salaries plus free housing if they trot on over to the United Arab Emirates and advise them on how to use United States military equipment. And then there are plenty of people, including, you know, electricians that had worked for the military, painters that had worked for the military, who can, you know, make quite a lot of money. And it's hard for people to turn that down, I guess. And where do the ethical questions come in? Um, I think nowhere. <laughs> and and where is the restraint? There, I think the Pentagon and the, the legions of lobbyists who keep on arguing for more and more militarism, uh, they they get, just get piles of cash that they can tap into, and it generates more greed. Kathy Kelly and Nick Matern, you also are making plans for a project uh, next year to raise ethical and legal questions called Merchants of Death. Uh, can you give us a, a bit of a preview of what's happening with that? Well, it's, it's been a, a very exciting project in many ways. But it's sad and it's grim because if you start to try to hold accountable some of the people who've been war profiteers, weapon peddlers and war profiteers, uh, you start to then ask, well, who were the victims? And then you're looking at people like Adel al -Mantari, in Yemen, or numerous people in Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, uh, so many places where the United States has uh, used these weapons, or U.S. allies like Saudi Arabia or Israel have used these weapons. And so we want to hold a tribunal wherein the witnesses would primarily be the victims who've survived these attacks. But we also are looking to bring in uh, military analysts and um, people who, from a philosophical perspective, can raise the moral issues that we think are so absent. So we're calling it the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. And uh, we particularly want to appeal to people in the D.C. area on November 10th to come and join a group who will deliver subpoenas to General Atomics, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon, and tell them, we now ask them to deliver to us the evidence that um, we believe has to be made public and will be uh, part of the November 10th and uh, 12th and 13th. We will leave it the 11th for Reclaim Armistice Day in 2023. But those are the days when we will have a primarily online presentation of the Merchants of Death Tribunal. Nick, do you want to add to, to what you're planning there? Uh, I, I, well, there are two things I, that I'd like to, to, to say. One is that this is uh, the first time that uh, weapons makers will be called on uh, to, in the way of saying you have a conscience independent of what anyone else may order or ask you to do. 
And you have a choice about whether you'll contribute to this mass suffering. Uh, it's a tribunal similar to the one that was conducted after the, uh, uh, as part of the Nuremberg war crimes trials. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say about what people can do, uh, we do have a website, bandkillerdrones.org. There's petitions on there that uh, against drone warfare, they can ask their local state and elected officials to sign. Also, I want to say something that's a little bit uh, off that point, but very central. Uh, in a, in a, these drones are used as substitute for soldiers. Soldiers and the wars that, that we've experienced in the last 20 years have to do with the capture of oil, gas, and other energy and mineral resources. This is the, what the war in Ukraine is about in many, many ways. I believe that it's incumbent on peace groups and, and environmental groups to, at this point, call on the U.S. government to ration gasoline, oil, and other uh petroleum products because not only are they contributing uh, to war, but they're also contributing to the climate emergency. And we haven't talked about rationing uh, in this country because that's viewed as a wartime kind of problem. But we are in a situation, if you go out on the highways in any, any major city, any part of the country, you'll see so many cars, so many trucks, burning, 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 burning gasoline. And rationing is a way to, to equitably uh, deal with this. And so when we think about drone warfare or any other kind of warfare, I think we have to think about what's driving it, what our consumption process and, and, and goals are that are driving war. And I think it's incumbent on any war people like ourselves to speak to the consumption problem as well as to the killing problem, because the consumption problem is really the feeding ground for all of these corporations uh, of one kind or another, including the military corporations. Also at that uh, time, the second week of November, there will be a global meeting happening in Egypt called COP27 and uh, World Beyond War and Veterans for Peace and numerous other groups will continue our demand that they stop leaving militaries out of climate calculations and climate agreements. Uh, a rather minor step, but a somewhat revealing one, I think, that they are so intent on excluding military fossil fuel emissions from all discussion of, of fossil fuel emissions. Um, right. The, the, I, 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 I've noticed that, you know, the, the five biggest weapons dealers are in the Washington, D.C. area. I think you named four of them that you're planning to visit, uh, but they all have facilities all over the place, including all over the United States. Um, do you want people to go and, and visit them and deliver subpoenas at, at all of their locations or just at the headquarters? I think that's a great idea, David, because the more we can spread this around, the better. Uh, and those subpoenas will be, they're all, they're identical uh, for each company and they will be appearing on our website. Um, uh, I, I think that we have to get into the streets here and we really have to put it in, in on those terms rather than just be behind our computer screens. And so uh, thank you for suggesting that. And sorry, go ahead, Kathy. Well, I think we should also call for reparations to be made and uh, ask people to consider boycotting the products of these companies. You know, Boeing's got a defense industry, but they've also got their uh, passenger planes, too. Um, there's choices we can all make every single day to say we're out. We don't want to be part of this war making system anymore. We can also take our investment money or our towns and counties and states investment money or our universities investment money out of these horrible companies. Uh, you can go to worldbeyondwar.org slash divest uh, to work on that sort of campaign. Um, but the the website is, is merchantsofdeath.org. Is that right? That's right. And, and as well as bankillerdrones.org. Um, what what do you make of, we've got just a few minutes left, uh, and it seems that uh, the Biden White House and the Congress and the people who came before them uh, year after year do nothing but try to 
keep Iran an enemy. That doesn't seem to be working out so well for people in, in Ukraine. Uh, what, is there any lesson to be learned uh, there in terms of making multiple enemies uh, that they're going to uh, share weapons with each other? Well, the whole misguided idea that we can continue to emphasize enemies that will give enough fear for people to uh, throw more cash at the Pentagon I, I think in a way endangers us all because unless we learn how to work together and collaborate with other countries, even countries we don't like, there's no way we can adequately address the climate catastrophe, pandemics, or nuclear weapon proliferation. So it's, it's a misguided, wrongful way of thinking, but the Biden administration just has continued what was sown um, and during the Obama administration as well. We just don't seem to get any let up from Democrats who are war hawks. I, uh, we, we've got just a, a minute left. Nick, I see in the U.S. media all the time, including this past week on the front page of the New York Times, you know, videos about how cool drones are, little spy drones on the good Ukrainian side of the war, telling them where the Russians are hiding. When we tried to, to ban drones in various uh, you know, places around the United States, we were told, oh, but there are good drones, drones that show you panda bears. And so, you know, is, is, this a real, is this a real problem? Are we not capable of banning murderous drones and keeping the other ones? What's, what do we have to do here? I, th I think that the, the, the sad reality is that people have to see people like them dying and suffering before they understand what people have been talking about. And when, uh, you know, <laughs> when your when your father or cousin or brother is Adele El Monthari, and it, and you can picture yourself that way, suddenly you don't want to have weapons on drones. Well, I, I hope we can somehow expand our 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 understanding of other people's suffering uh, fast enough to undo these things. Uh, we've been speaking with Nick Matern and Kathy Kelly, co-coordinators of BanKillerDrones.org, uh, and also planners of MerchantsOfDeath.org. Uh, check them out. We'll have the links up at TalkWorldRadio.org. Kathy and Nick, thank you very very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.